Welcome. This video is the fourth in a series called Market Access for Digital Entrepreneurs, brought to you by CEDA, the small enterprise development agency with support from the European Union. In this series, we have assembled a range of entrepreneurs, industry experts and subject specialists to share their insights and experience from different angles about commercializing startup digital products and services. These videos are first and foremost for entrepreneurs, but we hope they will also be of interest to incubator and hub managers and business advisors. In this webinar, we will take a look at the artificial intelligence or AI industry in South Africa. To tap into this market locally and internationally, you need to understand it, where the opportunities are and how to take advantage of them, as your success is determined by your understanding of the market, your product's competitiveness and the effectiveness of your sales methodology. It's a high growth sector with rapidly growing use cases, so it's fair to say that AI could profoundly change our daily lives in the years to come. Let's begin. My name is Crystal Hastings. I am the head of marketing at FinChatBot, which we will very soon refer to as fcb.ai. Just to tell you a little bit about what we do is fcb.ai offers performance-driven AI solutions. Our AI solutions combined with the digital ecosystem helps businesses conduct multiple customer journeys into a seamless customer experience for improved results. Our topic for today's webinar is riding the AI wave, pathways to commercialization. Um, and I'd like to give a very warm welcome to our panel of local and international AI technical development and commercialization experts. We have with us today, Mr. Colin Lesso, who is the Acting Executive Manager at CEDA Technology Program. We have Whale al Kabani, who is the MD at Enterprise MEA Microsoft South Africa. We've got Pius Ila, who is the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa. Rashmo Maraba, the Technical Advisor at 4IRI. Dr. Jacques Ludic, is the founder and CEO at Cortex Logic and Cortex Group. Ms. Shandani Kanduni, who is Natai, who is the CEO of African Nova Solutions. Ms. Tulong Matopa, who is the founder at RPA Nuggets. And our last speaker of the day will be Ryan Flackenberg, who is the CEO at Clever. So we really have an incredible lineup and I'm sure you'll get a lot of value today. My name is Colin and I am from CEDA. I am currently the acting executive for the CEDA technology program. What is artificial intelligence and what does it really mean for us? And I think when I look at it, it, it speaks about the development of computer systems, which is able to perform tasks that's normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and translation between languages. So we know that there's decision-making happening in our lives every day. Everything that we do on a daily basis basically speaks about the decision that needs to be made. And hence, we can then say that um, whatever we do in our daily lives, at, at our places of work, wherever we are at, it's got to do with artificial intelligence. And how do we bring artificial intelligence to the fore in terms of making sure that, um, you know, it is something that our, audience this morning would be able to also then uh, contribute on. <clears throat> so it, it, it also mimics, uh, you know, what human intelligence is. And for me, that is really just speaking about um, not only machine learning, because we know artificial intelligence speaks about machine le learning, but it also looks at really what is it that, that humans are doing, which machines can now do, and therefore machines learn what humans can do. We speak, of, so, uh, we also speak about robotics, we speak about, um, you know, big data, and we understand that all of this actually contributes 
to artificial intelligence and the makeup of artificial intelligence in its purest form. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that just sit back, um, you know, relax, um, go with what is being discussed this morning. Let them, uh, you know, give you information. Let them share their specific, um, you know, ideas. And you come in and you take those ideas, you take that information and you make it part of whatever it is that you want to see coming through and that you are wanting to then see um, happening not only within your business, but also within your daily lives. Because as I've said, we see artificial intelligence coming through in every decision that we make on a daily basis. On behalf of CEDA, um, the Small Enterprise Development Agency, I would also like to thank, uh, thank EDSE for always being there, um, assisting us in terms of bringing these sessions to um, you know the portfolio and to um, SMMEs, to, to small businesses, to entrepreneurs um, throughout the country. And really just say that we, we appreciate the work that you do with us and that we are able to then make sure that we can take this, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and other sessions similar to this one to the people. I think that when we look at a small business development and just basically businesses in general, then I understand that we have a long way to go as a country, but it is through these sessions that we will be able to um, just make sure that we are able to then uh, get to a point where a lot of businesses are then being assisted. So Martin, I see you on the platform, um, Martin Feinstein with the entire group. Thank you so much for, for your um, you know assistance, for everything that you help us with from a CEDA perspective. And I want to say that we always look forward to these sessions because they are so informative. They are so um, relevant to you know what we are doing within the CEDA technology program and how we would like to see the CEDA technology program moving forward. And my name is Kaya Skila, uh, the head of innovation, uh, sorry, the, the, the head of strategy and innovation at the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa. Um, and it's such an honor to be here today to be the, you know, first speaker at this session. And um, I will take you, I'll take everyone through a journey on how things are evolving and what are the key things that are you know, shaping the conversation on the African continent as far as the use and the adoption of smart technologies like artificial intelligence is concerned. Um, I would also like to mention here that I think about um, four or five years ago, uh, when I first became very active in the AI ecosystem in South Africa, a Fin chatbot was one of the solutions that I had the pleasure of uh, working with at the Stellenbosch University Launch Lab Incubator, where I was head of the ideas program at the time. I'll just start quickly by sharing a little bit about the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa, and everyone is going to get the privilege to also listen to Dr. Jack Ludig later on. Um, Jack Ludig founded the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa in 2015. The title of my presentation today is, you know, how can we use this technology uh, to shape a better future um, within the context of Africa. Um, how can, what can we do? What are the realistic things that we can do um, in the mold of technology adoption, technology use, venture commercialization, capacity building, education? Um, and how can we do that realistically with all the kinds of attention that this whole um, industry and sector is getting? Um, how can we move away from hype and boss and move into a world where we sort of systematically, you know, deploying, consuming, you know, and leveraging these capabilities that we that, that we now have. You know, um, I personally believe that Africa's time is now. Um, and why do I believe so? Um, I believe so because you know most of the things, most of the core enablers that you know makes a revolution tick. You know, most of the ingredients or the recipes for some sort of an economic or technological revolution, you know, um, is available now. In fact, some people call this the, the era of, of valuable free things, you know, and what are those valuable free things that we have? Uh, we've got abundance of talent on our continent. Um, 
you know, um, when you go across all of our universities in South Africa, you see that virtually every uh, computer science department has a section that is devoted to teaching and doing research, you know, in data science, artificial intelligence. Um, you, you also have a, a, a burgeoning population of young people. Uh, the price of computation is becoming more and more cheap and affordable. Um, for, for instance, you know, um, every one of us know that Google has taken the lead, Amazon Web Services has taken the lead in terms of providing some of this cloud infrastructure for us to be able to um, learn how to deploy these technologies in these environments. Um, and that and that wasn't so, say, maybe 10 years ago or at the smart of the technology era, you know. And if you want to say uh, that what is also very important for us to be able to move forward in this era you also pick a point around connectivity. So as much as the price of internet is still very expensive, you know, um, incubators and accelerators also take away some of these barriers because they provide a basic environment for people who have the right knowledge and the right capability to come and aggregate and get access to all kinds of resources and tools. Um, and for me, I think the most important thing is to now understand what is the missing link and what is the what is the absolute most important necessity to be able to leverage and consume, you know, uh, the, the technology at scale. Um, and I also want to touch on the point around our young people and the talent that we have on this continent. As much as there is abundance of talent, um, there is a little bit of polishing and crystalline that is needed to ensure that the young talented people can understand the value chain. You know, the value chain from understanding the problem, picking a business case, you know, understanding where all the data is, what type of data sets to use for certain kinds of computational tasks, um, how to leverage some of these free resources and capabilities that exist, you know, in the, with the power of the internet, um, and how to obsessively and compulsively solve for these relevant problems, not just in Africa, but anywhere else in the developing world and anywhere else in the developed world, as the case may be. Uh, do we have talents that are um, emotionally strong, that are resilient, that are driven, that are capable and competent of solving some of these very wicked problems. Um, and if we do have that, what are we doing strategically on a consistent basis to be able to empower them to do this, uh, to solve these problems at scale? You know, so this is some of the questions, some of the bunny questions that I have. Um, I'll just sort of like to touch on, again, just to do a little bit of recap, you know, on where we are coming from and where we are going to, uh, because there's, there's there's still a lot of um, buzz and there's still a lot of hype in the air. Uh, most people do not understand, um, you know, what what is so special about this AI transformation that is happening. And you can see how things have evolved, you know, from the 50s, you know, to the early 2000s, you know, um, and the early 2000s sort of being the era where um, internet became much more. Um, available to the critical mass of people. You know, you now have things like the internet of things becoming more mainstream, um, and that is pouring a lot of data into the world. You know, sort of, uh, to, you, Jack, to use Jack Liddick's term, uh, the world has been instrumented, um, and that instrumentation is leading to a mass amount of data pouring into the world. Um, and that creates a situation where um, if you know where the data sits in, you understand how to torture the data, to turn the data upside down, um, to treat it with respect and disrespect at the same time, um, it will confess, you know, and, and sort of the golden edge of this era is the data and the ability to work with the data um, to address whatever you want it to, to address for. And you really think that there is value in this kind of engagements and collaborations. But beyond sitting down here and attending a, a, a virtual conference, what are the practical things that everyone and any one of us here can do post this kinds of engagements to be able to be a champion or an evangelist, you know, to promote, to share, to leverage, and to push, you know, the values of this era out into the world. Um, you know, in our, in our case at MIA, we're very passionate about skills development, capacity building, and sort of connecting, you know, theoretical research in the laboratories with real-world implementation. 
Uh, we want to see a lot of AI entrepreneurs, you know, bust onto the scene, become unicorns, because uh, they can get a lot of value out of leveraging all the, the all the all the free tools and uh, free techniques that are out there in the ecosystem. Um, and I think for us, that is what keeps us, you know, up at night, and that's what gets us out of bed early in the morning. You know, um, just sort of looking at the the landscape in Africa. Um, and I mean, this slide that I just put up here speaks for itself to see how, you know, um, what, what are we really benefiting from artificial intelligence? You know, when we compare ourselves to places like North America, Northern Europe, uh, China, um, we are really eating a very small pie of the cake. Um, and as much as we still uh, very early stage, you know, in this era, um, are all the necessary things in place for us to be able to, you know, grab a larger pie of the cake or bake a bigger cake than what currently exists? Um, are we really able to use AI to leapfrog and drive transformation of the continent? Um, is government doing enough, you know, um, at, a, at, a, at a strategic and at a policy level? Do we have all the funds and all the political will that is needed to move from just, you know, um, a conversation and a hype, you know, paradigm to implementation, resourcefulness and, and solutions, you know, paradigm. Uh, so those are also some of the questions that I, you know, want to put out there. Perhaps we can engage deeper and further, you know, as far as that is concerned. You know, and for, for us, you know, we are also very passionate about what is the practical, realistic things that are able to help businesses thrive, um, leveraging smart technologies. You know, and recently I was just having a conversation with somebody, you know, how things have changed in the last five years and how things have changed in the last 10 years in terms of how uh, companies and organizations com consume, you know, um, um, uh, technological powers. Uh, you see most organizations have now invested, so maybe previously in on-site infrastructure um, that, you know, has now become available within the whole notion of infrastructure as a service. Um, and these things are provided, these uh, platforms and capabilities are provided by companies like, you know, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, IBM. Um, and so it means that anyone in any corner of the world with good internet and a good machine can sort of perform very basic, you know, uh, business tax, you know, but from operational analytics to diagnostics, you know, predictive analytics, you know, optimization analytics, um, and all these kinds of things. And, and, and it means that if we empower a critical mass of people to be able to understand, you know, how to hunt, you know, for maybe geeks, because we're in the geek economy, and how to solve problems at enterprise levels, you know, how to put themselves out there, hunt for opportunities and solve problems at enterprise level. Um, anyone and everyone can invoice and get paid for providing business relevant solutions to businesses. Um, and this is important because in South Africa right now, we're still battling with our massive unemployment issues. Um, and realistically, uh, the only way we can attempt to solve this problem in this time is to leverage the digital world more than we've done ever before. In terms of what are the practical solution drivers, you know, in the smart technology game. And, you know, at the personalization level, you have options like the AI churn, the AI risk, um, the AI recommend, AI insight, you know, um, at the engaged level, you have personal assistance, you know, email sorting solutions, you know, AI HR administration, AI learn, um, and also at the sense level, you have AI audio, AI vision, AI geo, and AI internet of things. You know, and all of these suites of solutions, you know, affect various kinds of businesses. You know, in a manufacturing environment, for instance, you have uh, the enhancement, you know, where you can use certain kinds of special algorithms to detect faults. You know, you can use uh, special kinds of algorithms to detect fraud, fraud to provide security to the enterprise. You know, and all of these are the suits of solutions, you know, within the, the AI ecosystem. Um, and for us, it is important now to be very practical and very intentional in terms of how we expose, you know, the army of young people that we are charged with looking after 
to what the real problems are within enterprise. You know, where are the data sets sitting? Uh, what can we do to this data sets? You know, and how can we improve it and solve realistic problems? You know, to be able to sort of consummate the opportunity as it is. Um, I think for me, that is where I would like to end my presentation this morning to say, what realistically are we doing in this era to empower young people to understand how they can connect the dots, how they can solve for the real world, and how they can emerge as the victors of the smart technology era. Um, yes, so with that, I'll end my presentation and take questions. That is actually number one, number one question um, anyone should be obsessing about in this era. And the reason is because uh, we're now entering a time where there's so much happening in the world, right? There's a lot of uh, threats and a lot of aggression um, in the world. There's a lot of uh, issues with the pandemic that we have. Um, and there's a lot of issues in developing countries like Africa where you have a brutality oppression, you know, from nation states to nation states and from nation states to people. Um, so the human element of artificial intelligence is the crown opportunity within the smart technology space because it provides, you know, us the necessary kinds of confidence we need if we believe that we can really treat the data of people with responsibility and dignity. We can really build solutions that are not going to start wars and end the human civilization or attempt to end the human civilization. Um, if we believe that we can follow certain kinds of rigorous scientific principles in terms of validating the solutions that we build and put out into the world so that it doesn't cause harm. Uh, imagine a situation where a human being is opened up um, by a robot who is about to perform a surgery on that person and there is a little bit of a glitch somewhere. You know, it becomes um, a dark and a bitter stain in our mouths if anything goes wrong. So the whole issues around ethical AI is the crown, like I said, is the number one thing that we should obsess about because it means that if we don't get that right, um, we will be far worse and the whole optimism and the whole excitement will be worthless because humanity will not benefit anything if the ethical aspect of artificial intelligence is not taken into consideration. Um, and just a final point that I also want to raise here is because I personally do not consider this revolution to just be the revolution of the STEM discipline. By that I mean the science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, I see this multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary opportunity, right? And what that means is we now have room for all kinds of people from all kinds of domains, the arts, the liberal arts, the legal profession, uh, everyone. This is a free fall opportunity for everyone, um, irrespective of what your primary background is. Um, and I just want to make a quick point to say that I am a little bit um, on the side, on the on the school of thought that believes that AI is going to create more jobs than it's going to take. Uh, because, you know, when we were moving from um, riding horses to now driving cars, um, the horse breeders were at risk of losing their jobs. But look where we are now. Um, and the same thing when we were moving, you know, uh, you know, when we were moving from wooden tires for, for chariots to rubber tires, you know, the same fears were expressed that those who, you know, created these wooden tires were going to lose their jobs. Uh, but look where we are now. Um, and, and I think that all we have to do is to obsess and create an environment for young people to be able to see themselves playing a role in this uh, in this, uh, in this era, both entrepreneurs, both scholars, you know, anyone and everyone has a place in this technological era and we must nudge them in the direction where they can move forward. Yeah. Absolutely. It's not about replacing humans, but maybe changing roles a little bit um, yes. so that it aligns with the kind of future direction that we're heading in. Because my heart is very much in the education side, um, I like to look at the first step is to reskill, upskill 
um, and take away most of the fears that people have. Instead of, uh, if you imagine this kind of, you know, uh, old time door to door evangelists uh, who were uh, propagating the Christian doctrine and Christian gospel at once upon a time, um, they'll come to your house, knock on your door, sit down on your couch, you give them water, and they have a conversation about Jesus Christ. They were very, you know, bold, very confident, and very evangelical. Um, I'd say we should take the same approach um, in a less aggressive, but in a very, in a very calculated way. And what that means is some of the very basic conversations around artificial intelligence should be had in schools, you know, um, not even high schools, but primary schools. Um, we should incentivize um, the whole, you know, notion of translating empirical research into real world solutions because um, you see a great dichotomy between the research that is being done in our universities and the way the private and the public sector is commercializing artificial intelligence. Um, so it's an 80-20 thing, 80% academics working very hard, publishing all the time, advancing and moving the frontiers of knowledge in the AI forward every day, but industry is still lagging behind in terms of the consumption. So if we start the conversation early on, groom, you know, across the value chain, young people who are in primary schools, high schools, you know, young people who are in universities, entrepreneurs, um, and also introduce executive programs into the mainstream to educate decision makers on the cost saving benefits of leveraging artificial intelligence solution. Um, if we're able to do some of these things incrementally, we can see the right kind of results you know, across um, public and private sector that is needed. Um, the other thing is also the policy that is making it possible for people to feel that they have the right kinds of protection to trust these kinds of technologies. Uh, these are the things that we also need to have a look at, both at, at a national and a continental level, in my opinion. Right. And I think something that, you know, we've come across quite a lot in our space is it's also corporates need to support uh, startups and technology businesses or technology entrepreneurs and vice versa. For example, a technology entrepreneur has a very specific focus um, in an AI area that a large corporate may not know much about. So you get quite a lot of synergy by working together. So that whole ecosystem really does need to work together to get better results. If there's any government in Africa that has been very proactive in terms of providing support it is the South African government. I say this because I am not South African, so I know that South Africa is really on top of most other countries in Africa. However, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and that example is with the CDAFYR, you know, hubs that are being spread across the country. I know the Technology Innovation Agency is also doing a lot of work in terms of, you know, supporting uh, both urban and rural universities and institutions to be able to give access to those people. Uh, but in the future, some of the things or some of the barriers are also going to be lifted organically because as more and more people leverage digital technologies, the price of things like bandwidth, you know, becomes a lot cheaper than what it is now. Um, and also things like the mobile phone is actually a very powerful tool. And with a mobile phone, people in rural areas, if they're connected to the source of opportunity, can perform some of the basic tasks, you know, for, a, for AI solutions deployment, like data annotation. So it's like the whole data labeling thing. You know, you take a call center data and you're able to say annotate, for instance, um, with your cell phone or with your tablet. Uh, but just to touch on the points that I raised earlier, that things like the fire our digital incubators or digital labs are there because they're central points where communities can gravitate towards um, and they can seize the opportunity and get all the right support that they need. Uh, but the most important thing is to also have uh, people who are trained to be able to identify this opportunity and become very entrepreneurial about it, you know, to see a place for themselves irrespective of what their limitations might be. Um, I think for us, that is in Africa, that is the 
best way that we can benefit from this is to, you know, within ourselves as individuals, be very aggressive and opportunistic about this whole thing, but to also go where the support has been provided, you know, yeah. Great, thank you. And I think there's um, there's so much to be said around, you know, funding of an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial venture. There's, there's so much, and we could probably do a whole separate topic around that um, mm -hmm. on getting that off the ground. But there is significant interest in the world around um, technology and AI to sort of drive the future direction. So if you've got a good idea, um, don't let it go. Without further ado, guys, I would like to tell you about the Fourth Industrial Revolution Incubator and our digital hub that we have and some of our centers and our service offerings around AI, drones, and, and normal business incubation. So firstly, what is uh, incubation? Uh, incubation is basically um, a, a, safe, a safe ground for, for, for SMMEs within AI, technology, and so forth like that. We all know that uh, technology is, is not like a one size fit all. It's not like your, your typical businesses that, that we have on a day to day, uh, or your, your service businesses like your butcheries and so forth like that. Um, when it comes to technology business, we have to do the groundwork, we have to do the coding and so forth like that, and as well as the cybersecurity and, and things like that. So when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution, we look into de-risking those type of things within um, IP registration and, and so forth like that. So. Um, our vision, what is our vision of, for, for our eye? So basically we have five cornerstones within our incubation and our digital hub centers, which is we help the SME uh, firstly have futuristic futuristic thinking and is of course uh, expert-led growth and as well as innovative job creation. What do I mean by innovative job creation? I mean, uh, five years ago, none of us knew that if you sit in your room and say, hi guys, welcome to my YouTube channel, that could be a job. You know, and that's the type of innovative job creations that we look at. We look at um, how we can use artificial intelligence to do data analytics and monotonous jobs that 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 are that are quite um, uh, repetition and so forth like that to make it more optimized. Uh, building a digital economy. I mean, there was a question that someone asked: um, How do 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 we have uh, access to to? How do people in rural areas have access to these type of technologies? And this is where the four four IRI comes in by actually allowing SMMEs to actually tap into the rural areas and bringing technology to the people of the rural areas, whether it's um, Wi-Fi, whether it's um, um, free internet, whether it's um, the digital hubs, the rural area digital hubs, and CEDA as well have um, um, rural development programs that they also uh, roll out. So it's actually, it's actually quite a great initiative on how um, we're actually concentrating on, on developing the rural areas when it comes to building uh, the digital economy. And last but not least, uh, enabling citizens to, to building their own businesses, you know, um, enabling that uh, particular student to actually going out there, whether they did uh, data analytics and, and um, whether it's in a criminal law, for instance, for them to actually go and, and opening their own law firm and, and integrating technology and AI to, to, to reading those type of uh, cases and so forth like that. So the, the whole fourth industrial revolution incubator is to lead Africa's digital narrative and to creating an enabling preferred ecosystem to commercialize disruptive technology and not only disruptive technology, technology that is disruptive and will actually make a, a, a our South African economy grow. Basically technology that is locally relevant and globally applicable. Very exciting as well, our facilities, our 4IRI facilities, we've got four facilities, five actually facilities within um, South Africa. We've got our main um, hub, with it, which is in Maro's Arc in Johannesburg, and we focus on the EDS uh, programs and as well as our normal incubation program. Then we have where I am currently based, which is uh, the sunny side of Nalsprate, uh, where we focus on as well um the incubation program and our eds program and as well as our ai course and as well as our drone course which i'll touch on a bit later um we are recently established and launching a cape town hub with the partnership of cisco edge 
Um, it's in Century City in Cape Town, and we are quite excited about that. And as well as we have a flight school in Sukunda, whereby we have PPL training and as well as um, drone training, which students can come and do their personal uh, private training, uh, personal pilot training, and as well as their remote uh, pilot training when it comes to drone simulation and, and so forth like that. So basically our verticals that we look into, we have a two year to three year program within our incubation and we look into the development of the prototype because we all know that um, coding an app or a, 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 a particular chatbot or a anything that has to do with coding or product development takes time and takes research. So we actually help you with that and so forth like that when it comes to uh, conducting the research and development, planning the strategic uh, path of commercialization, market access and so forth like that, working capital and we work with industry experts to help you get that working capital and as well as uh, but being within our ecosystem and working with other SMMEs as well in order for you and the other SMME to grow um, your business. And as well as when it comes to training and mentorship, because at the end of the day, uh, some uh, business or some entrepreneurs are not really um, coders and some coders or, or engineers are not really business savvy. So we try bridge the gap when it comes to training and mentorship, whether it's training through our business development or through, uh, training through our AI course, machine learning, uh, drones, or, 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 or just simple technical advice. When it comes to our verticals, the fourth industrial revolution verticals, we look into big data, um, augmented reality, internet of things, cloud computing, cybersecurity, which I think is the most important thing because we all know that Facebook, uh, WhatsApp and so forth was shut down and, and most people don't really know why they were shut down or to find out that there was a whistleblower in cybersecurity and, and the fact that Facebook was selling people's data to third party uh, marketing agencies and people actually did not know that. So cybersecurity is actually very important because our data is out there. We take cyber selfies every day and where do our pictures go those type of things is is what we actually try help the SME try try to understand within their business how to keep their data safe and so forth like that when it comes to system integration using uh, different uh, systems and different engineering systems uh, or QMS systems or CRM systems to help to help the SME integrate and optimize their business solutions of course, we, all, we are all here to speak about the artificial intelligence, but people don't really actually grasp on what artificial intelligence is. Artificial intelligence could be basically embedded into anything and everything that we do. And I can tell you off the bat that the, the cell phone that you have in your pocket is, is 10 times, has 10 times more the computing power that the Apollo 13 had back in, in 1994, if I'm correct. And, and that's just a small um, tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding the technology and the artificial intelligence and the computing power that we currently have. Then we look at um, uh, basically advanced manufacturing. When we look at places like China, Hong Kong, they, they, they hold ecosystem and their whole environment is based on exporting through the additive manufacturing using uh, faster machines, using QRM systems and artificial intelligence and parts and sensors and so forth to faster uh, make um, your manufacturing better and and the thing is as a south africans we need to understand how important manufacturing is because uh in the presidential commission of 20, 2023 if i'm correct or 2030 we have to increase the amount of exporting our local goods by 30 percent and how we're going to do this is by actually um, um increasing our 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 manufacturing space and actually manufacturing more of our local goods out there and how do we do this by using our SMMEs within the technology space, by using the SMMEs that are already into manufacturing and helping them scale up and giving them the funding and the non-financial uh, support that they need. Uh, looking into simulation, simulation is also very important when it comes to product development because we need to understand what are we actually simulating and how and, and having a, a, a frequent data plan to actually know which routes are we gonna take. 
moving moving slightly forward to our incubation model so how do we uh, take a grassroots uh, SMME all the way up to launching an investor pitch and actually going out there and receiving funding. So it is a, a step-by-step program that we use, which is an upscaling, a bootcamp, and as well as market linkage and acceleration and, uh, and as well as launch. When it comes to upscaling, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this is the training through business development or through technical development. When it comes to bootcamp, we actually uh, put them through hackathons and so forth like that and research development and product development either through using our 3D printers or our our uh, industry experts which is our partners through women in AI and so forth like that and market link is talking to um, big corporations out there such like your CSIR, your Cisco and so forth to, to actually let the SMME plug into that particular value stream and our Qualifying criteria is, of course, the innovation has to be um, disruptive. It has to be a South African uh, SMME, and they have to actually be generating some sort of uh, revenue over 500,000 in that particular year. And they have to actually require assistance um, through through either way, it's through big data or AI. So now the four IRI. Uh, we have courses, as I've mentioned, uh, we have AI courses, uh, machine learning courses who are actually actually being rolled out as we currently speak and as well as our drone courses out there. So can actually feel free to go onto our website and read about the, the offerings within the AI machine learning courses that we do offer and feel free to actually apply or uh, give us a shout if you have questions and so forth like that, because at the end of the day, you don't know what you don't know. And the more questions you ask is actually knowing on what what you will be actually receiving. So it's actually quite great when it comes to artificial intelligence courses that we have. And we actually started from grassroots, which is basic, basic courses, understanding, letting the people understand what AI is firstly, then going into Python and, and so forth like that. And, and your your frameworks of uh, Python and the, the lifestyle of the life cycle of the particular program that you would be co coding, whether it's your chatbot or your your big data analysis or anything that that you actually be going to or even something simple like um a a, a hr system which will be collecting uh data and simplifying i just want to contextualize things very briefly uh because i think it's also relevant for the people here as we transition we, we obviously want to make sure that businesses thrive and entrepreneurs and businesses in SMEs thrive in the smart technology era. And when I talk about the smart technology era, the fourth industrial revolution, people talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I think it's not just industrial, it touches every part of society and economy um, in various sectors and industries, a massive social impact as well. So my massive transformative purpose and that of my businesses and non-profit organizations is how can we shape a better future in the smart technology era? How can we use smart technology to enable that? And AI is just a proxy for smart technology. There's more smart technology tools in that toolbox, but AI is probably the most impactful one and in combination with uh, a few others. Um, Dr. Currency, just, uh, if you look at um, um, blockchain technology as such, but, but also some of the, the others, um, that's quite important. Very briefly, um, obviously, you mentioned Cortex Logic and Cortex Group. Um, we've even we, we've actually transitioned Cortex from uh, AI enterprise solutions business, which I will be talking about now. So I'll, I'll talk through some of the the things that SMEs and businesses in general and uh, should be doing to become AI driven, AI dr driven dig digital well transformed to be transformed in a, in an AI digital fashion. Um, so I'll be talking about that specifically. But what we are doing ourselves is we're drinking, drinking our own cool aid. And what we are doing is to apply um, all of that in generating an AI-driven digital platform where we more provide specific solutions that we can control in terms of the data gathering and how we work with data and the, and the solutions that we offer. And you see the result of that is, is things like Journey, which is a wellness solution um, a digital wellness solution. We're looking at democratizing digital healthcare. And Vive Teens is an example of a AI-driven 
app platform focused on teenage mental health, very focused solutions, but AI driven. It's got intelligent virtual assistants, there's data mining at a back end, all the principles and things that we apply with normal businesses for the AI enterprise, we apply here as well. So I just wanted to, to briefly mention that. And then the final thing before I get into the rest of the presentation is, um, I, do, I did write a book, Democratizing AI, AI to Benefit Everyone. And in that particular book, I, I, I speak very much to the topic of this whole session here, where I'm showing how you can actually transform a business. Um, and I'm gonna talk about, the, 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 well, I'd go in much more detail there about how you can transform businesses uh, to become truly, to, to thrive in this era. But I'm also going through many, many different examples in almost all the sectors and industries as well. So there's other things that I talk about there as well, but uh, I, I just wanted to mention, I actually go through lots of different examples. So it's worthwhile looking at that. And the audio book will be available um, this month worldwide on, on all the channels, Apple and, and, Play, and, and, and Play Store and Audible and so forth. Um, and, and, we, and, and another important thing is we need to be super agile. Um, there's another article that I referenced in my book as well, where they talk about, especially in COVID-19, it's only the agile that survive. So I have actually talked about what does it take to survive? And as we talk about smart technology, adoption, those type of things, uh, but because of the speed of technology change, there's there's uh, there's real pressure on businesses to 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 not uh, rest on their laurels uh, as well. So we live in the AI era. Um, I think you can almost categorize the era just before that as the internet era. Uh, but with all the instrumentation, and when I mean by instrumentation, I mean that what we're doing as a, as a civilization right now with all the technologies and with the internet and with social media and cell phones and all of this, we're creating enormous amounts of consumer facing data that complement the industrial IoT sensor data that was that was there for a, quite a while. Um, and we've got a lot more data to work with, data rich world that we've entered and that changes the ball game. It sets things up for, uh, for all sorts of things, AI machine learning, but also decentralized transactions are all sorts of different things. So it's fascinating times. I'm going to just skip a few slides here and I'm going to want to go straight to this. So when you look at any business, it's me, it doesn't matter what business you, you, you are in, you've got to start with the outcomes. You've got to think about the business value drivers to thrive in the smart technology era. Um, and I've just categorized um, and uh, the, the big drivers into these buckets. So on the left hand side, I've got increasing operational efficiency, effectiveness and revenue. And when you look at industrial or consumer facing business, consumer facing business, it's all about the user. It's all about how do I cross sell, upsell? How do I uh, don't lose customers? On the industrial side, it's all about how can I improve my processes? How can I ensure my equipment is available so that I can increase my throughput, increase my yield, increase my quality? And then, so you want to increase productivity, increase revenue, and you can use AI, machine learning, smart technology to help you with that. And then obviously recommendation, we see that recommendation engines everywhere with Google, Amazon, Netflix, uh, all those type of companies, but any consumer facing um, kind of business, uh, financial services, all of those kind of businesses, retail recommendation engines is, is, a, is a really big part of that. And that's based on data um, and data mining and, and doing these recommendations. Um, but then you also want to reduce risk. So you want, don't want process and equipment failure. You don't want customers to go away, customer churn, um, fraud, waste and abuse is huge. And a previous speaker just talked about cybersecurity, hugely a big area. And we will see more and more AI um, coming into the play, their data-driven approaches to automate things. Um, so that's a huge risk for many, many businesses as we become more digital. And then we want to lower costs. So you obviously want to in increase your automation, but you want to eliminate redundancy. Uh, industry In the industrial space, you want to obviously reduce energy and raw material usage and look at your operations and maintenance. So with all of this, as, you become, as we become more data-driven, and we almost create digital twins of our businesses, of our operations, of our people, et cetera, um, there's more and more opportunities to actually optimize and create, uh, do, do special things. But then there's the, the, this, the middle bucket here, and it's all about creating strategic value. 
So how can we make faster, better, more, more proactive decisions? Um, how can we in, improve our R&D, be smarter, forecasting, innovation, collaboration, enhance scalability? But not only that, we know that data is the new oil. It opens up possibilities to create new business models, new revenue growth opportunities. And that's exactly what we're doing with our AI-driven business businesses that we're busy with, platform businesses. Um, there's opportunities to create new business models and latch onto what we're currently doing. There's growth opportunities. And then the last bucket here is more focus on the customer consumer side where it's really all about, we want real-time on-demand digital personalized service delivery assistance and advice. So you want to create that, that enhanced customer experience, have more targeted sales and marketing, and there's a bunch of things that one can do in that regard. And then obviously for that, you, you, you need to do 360 degree insights. You need to get that about your consumer. And, and you can then obviously in that space, for me, it's like AI on both sides. It's on the human computer interface, where you can use intelligent virtual assistants, maybe augmented reality, virtual reality, um, anything where you can get better interaction with your customer, real-time interaction. Um, but then there's also mining that data because as you interact with the customer, every click, every interaction is data that you can mine and do something with. And you obviously want to do this in a trustworthy, ethical way. So that's another thing that's super, super important. Um, so I'm gonna, I just wanna skip a few things. I just wanted to quickly, just the way we've organized things in, in Cortex Logic, I think it's relevant in general. I'm just gonna be very brief here. Um, so just talking to the things that I've just mentioned, the business value drivers, um, you can create very much personalized solutions for those consumers in terms of churn, risk, pricing. So for instance, one of the applications for one of the banks, we did dynamic pricing, home loan pricing where you can actually have individualized, personalized dynamic pricing, not just um, a pricing that's uh, a a focused on, a, on a, just big categories necessarily. Or um, So there's a, quite a bit that you can do, much more machine learning driven, much more personalized. And then the whole thing about in, um, human computer interface, the engagement, there's so much that one can do. To be smarter with emails, uh, uh, just the way you chat, uh, via websites, the search, uh, all of those kind of things. And then I would say on the industrial side, especially you will see the detection of problems, um, uh, real-time causal analysis, optimization of processes and, and, and plants and equipment. But then in general, fraud, security, hugely important areas. And then for me in the 2010s, the big thing that was added to the AI toolbox was just the fact that we can work not only with the normal numerical data and categorical data, but we can now work with audio, vision, geospatial data, IoT data at scale. Um, so this is where the sense comes in. And that adds so much um, to the, uh, you, you see what Tesla is doing with self-driving cars and how they're using uh, vision cameras, uh, footage and, and video and so forth to, to create incredible solutions. Um, so I'm gonna, I just wanna quickly continue. I don't wanna go too much in detail about these things. Uh, and, and what I just wanted to say before I get into um, just more specific things that SMEs can do as well. So this is just some examples of, of uh, just to speak a bit more specific to the things that I've done, uh, that we've done. So smart personalized recommendation for retail customers. Uh, this is one of the case studies for 8 million loyalty scheme members making impact there. I've mentioned the dynamic price optimization for predicting home loans. A percentage increase in home loans market share translates to billions of rands. So there's a huge, so it's again, going back to the business value drivers. Is this stuff that we are doing making an impact? So from a SME perspective, you should always be asking, what is that quick wins? What, what, what is the bottom line? What, how can I contribute to the bottom line of the business? I think a big thing for any consumer facing business is personalized intelligent virtual assistance. So we've created wellness, so says, uh, both on the health wellness and financial wellness um, side. We've done quite a bit of work and I've talked about Vive Teens that we've spun out, spun out as a separate company focused purely on teenage mental health um, and and uh, young adults and so forth uh, around that community. And we're using blockchain and cryptocurrency and we're creating our own VIV token along with all the AI. So using that full smart technology toolbox. Um, churn prediction insurance, massive opportunities. Here is an example of cost savings between 100 and 120 million rand per annum. 
Um, and then the normal automation stuff that you see with robotic process automation, there's quite a bit of machine learning stuff that you can add value there as well, um, where you can make a difference. Fraud detection, we've mentioned before, risk scoring for hospital benefit management, significant savings through exception management and fraud waste and abuse, lots of savings there. Um, and then also on the technology, uh, in the industrial side, and, and my, my previous AI company, Season Systems, that was sold to General Electric, we focus exclusively on the industrial manufacturing, mining, minerals, metals, space. Um, and this is just an example with Cortex, where we also looked at um, AI-driven automation of mining operations to increase revenue and reduce risks. Okay, so these are just very specific examples. I'm gonna skip the, uh, uh, there's a whole wellness coach thing, uh, which is very interesting and topical, but I, I wanted to, and there's things around AI-driven cybersecurity, quite a bit of stuff. Uh, a year uh, as well but what i wanted to very briefly end off with um i think my my time is limited so so how companies are adopting AI. this is this is i do go into a lot more detail in the book as well but the six characteristics of early AI adopters is digitally mature and typically you see the larger businesses um have a kind of afford to actually use their data to make a difference but i don't think there's a problem for SMEs to do this because you can start generating your own data. Even if you implement intelligent virtual assistants with your customers, that generates data. So you should always be thinking about smart ways to, to, to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, data for your business. Um, there's call centers, interaction, there's lots of data. That, uh, and I think Ryan Falkenberg will be talking about clever solutions in that regard as well. But adopting AI in core activities, Adopting multiple technologies, focusing on growth over savings. Those are important ones. So well, both is important areas. And you've got to have executive level, su uh, level support for that. So, so if you think about AI-driven digital transformation catalysts to generate business value. So if you want to say, this is time, I want to bring, I want to accelerate the path to value generation. It doesn't matter what business you're in. There's five things, five elements of successful AI transformation. And the first one starts with the use case as a sources of value. And that's what I talked about initially when I talked about uh, um, the business value drivers. What are, what are those things? It's very important to figure that out. What's the intent? Um, and then the data is super important. You want to create the data ecosystems and put the data, you've got to have data availability, very important. And then techniques and tools, you've got to make sure you've got the tools. If you don't have the skills and to use the tools, then partner with solution pro AI solution providers, um, build, hire the right skills internally to help with that. Lots of open source tools available these days um, to do so much. It will, there's no excuses anymore. Um, then obviously in terms of people, uh, data, data science skills availability, but it's also um, open, uh, the, the culture organization. You gotta have, gotta have an open culture and organization. And you gotta think about your processes because the moment you implement the AI solution or any kind of digital transformation solution, it's got an impact on people, on your workflows, etc. So you gotta think in a responsible way about process and change management and organization alignment and so forth. So these things are very important. And uh, here is just a bit more details around that. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through that, but you can, this is just something that I've used from the Industrial Data Corporation. I've used this at General Electric. I've used this at Jumo. I've used, used this in Cortex Logic uh, and my businesses as well. Um, where you can actually measure, you can look at your, your five elements here intent, your strategy. You can think of technology, people, data, and processes, and you can look at your maturity. Are you in an ad hoc state or opportunistic state, repeatable state, a managed state, or an optimized state? And it might be that you are quite good on the technology front, but not on the people front or not in the data front. Well, without the data, you're anyway not gonna get proper solutions, but you've got to look at your process. You've got to look at, uh, are, are, am I working on the right use cases? So, so those kind of things are very, very important. So the future of AI, I would love to see a more human centric kind of future. And I talk quite a bit about this in the book. I've got a massive transformative purpose for humanity defined. I've got, uh, there's, some, there's some really exciting ideas that, that we need people to, to tap into. But if we create a future where tools are just tools and it's helping us, then augmented intelligence is super important. There will be places for autonomous intelligence, but what we want is use AI as a tool with a warm embrace of humans to provide better services, human-centric services with compassion that we value. So if you think about, even if you think about jobs, you can actually look at 
um, uh, looking at teachers and elder companion and volunteers and all sorts of things, creative works and so forth that could be on the top quadrant if you look at this. Um, and so I do see a future where we don't want to do boring things. We don't need compassion that where, where it can be completely automated. So AI can play that space. But the moment it moves to creativity and strategy, yes, we know AI can make a difference there, but we can engineer society where AI and smart technology is existing us. But the moment it's going above here, when it's more about compassion and human services that we're starting to really value, then humans can play a, a big role there. Um, and you, you will just see we use augmented, autonomous and, and, and um, assisted intelligence everywhere. So the short answer is all three of those has, have arrived. We're going to see a lot more autonomous intelligence going forward. Um, according to PwC, that will be probably the biggest market. Um, but, but still, I think we need to engineer, be, be just smart and wise, how we engineer society and what we value. And then the future will look bright for humanity. In my opinion, I come from uh, a technology support background or an incubation support background. So um, I think the strategy of having an environment where most of the early stage barriers are taken away is a very, very strong step in the right direction. Uh, but over and above that, once people are in a space where they are comfortable, they're no longer worried about internet access, they have uh, seasoned mentors, both locally and internationally at the bed and call, and they know where all the tools are, how to connect the tools and how to use the tools. Um, the layer on top of that should be a consistent and intentional effort at immersing these people in the places where most of the problems are. And I think the, the private sector environment sits with a lot of data. Uh, Dr. Jack was mentioning earlier that the world instrumented in the 2000s uh, with IoT sen sensors, uh, th th that era brought in a lot of data. Um, and most of this data are sitting perhaps in places where they've not been utilized well. Uh, so once an environment has been created where people can sit and work and solve problems, a uh, consistent effort should be made to immerse people in the place where the problems are and in the place where that opportunity can be, uh, you know, harnessed. And that is in the private sector. So things like industry measures, you know, industry visits, um, you know, anything that has to do with giving people the ability to see the opportunity and the problem in one place and to seize that opportunity by solving that problem should be done by decision makers like government. Um, and another thing that I want to add finally is to also give young people the ability to understand, you know, how to leverage these capabilities to connect one another. And I speak in an African context where uh, South Africa has a lot of things that are good that can also cross borders to other African countries. Um, and if entrepreneurs in South Africa are solving problems in Botswana and in Nairobi, then they can actually bring in foreign direct investment into the country. But it starts with you know having more and more incubators, accelerators, that are focused on the fourth industrial revolution uh, aspects. And I think the government is already doing that, yeah. we do provide drone training it's unfortunate that um, our drone training is at a cost uh, when it comes to the remote operating certificate it is a very expensive and lengthy um, activity unfortunately the CAA is one of the toughest organizations to work with to be honest uh, due to the fact that their cornerstone is about uh, safety as well so yes you can give us a shout on our website to answer Temple's question and then we can take it from there. Uh, CEDA do have um, your your rural um, area programs um, we are currently based in in, in Pumalanga now spread um, but there are SMMEs and there are other um, incubator centers that are based in the rural areas so yes there is to answer the question <laughs> awesome that's good news 
Um, another question that's come up and another one for you, David. This is a bit of a long one. Hi, David. My name is Simpiwe, uh, founder of uh, Sankofa Solutions. It's a startup materials handling a center that looks to address waste challenges and advance a circular economy in lower income townships and sun urban areas looking to offer services that will maximize return rates of generic beverage containers from the generic public and may only do informal recyclers through reverse bending machines. Does 4IRI incubate and help fund such organizations? Yes, thank you for that again, Crystal, and um, the, for, uh, the person asking the question. We we incubate a, a technology SMMEs that have a disruptive technology. So if you are in waste management and you need to uh, optimize your your operations by using IoT or smart devices to help you, for instance, um, um, capture the data or anything that will help you optimize and have a disruptive nature towards uh, what your industry falls in, whether it's using IoT devices, HML, which is human interface uh, machineries and so forth like that. So we can help you uh, get funding through your, your CIFAs and CEDAs and so forth like that to get those particular machineries that you need or upscale your, your business. My name is Shandu Ganyantai. I am the CEO and founder of Africa Novi Solutions. We are a data consultancy and disruptive tech solution company based here in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, and we just basically utilize the, um, disruptive technologies such as IoT, machine learning, and data analytics in order to you know, um, address many unique African um, problems that we find in our economy and in Africa. Um, the two use case studies that we've actually implemented such disruptive technologies has been um, within the smart waste management space and in what also within the construction space. And what we found is that through the um, systems, through an IoT um, system that also uses um, elements of AI and machine learning, we've obviously been able to optimize those, those two sectors um, through the implementation of those technologies. The biggest challenges that I faced was definitely, um, you know, it's kind of acquiring your your kind of first customers and those people to type it, to believe in you. I think that also, as especially in the tech space, you spend a lot of time kind of explaining the tech in itself and educating your client on the tech and its benefits and everything. So it was a huge challenge in the beginning because it because tech does require a lot of money and it, it's something that takes a lot of patience, especially if you're ap applying stuff like machine learning and AI and analytics into the mix it does take space to get you know those kind of results or to figure out or identify those patterns so i think that was a huge challenge that i think people um how we overcame it it was just that it really does boil down to customer relations and just doubling down on that and reassuring them and you know also just producing the work so if that meant hiring someone else who's more um who's more equipped to assist in this whole thing then that would be it and you know just honestly just taking your customer on that journey with you as much as you can and dimis like di di demystifying i think i'm pronouncing that wrong the whole tech space for the for your client so that they can understand it from their perspective moving forward um the second challenge like i mentioned before earlier was definitely um funding um in the in the especially in the beginning stages. Um, like I said, there is a lot of funding out there, but it is there is a lot of requirements. And one thing that I've realized is that um, we're not like the United States whereby um, lots of ideas get funded. No, you need traction, you need you need uh, you need proven traction, you need proof of proof of revenue and everything, which is a bit limiting. Um, for our, for in our particular case, I think what was kind of our saving grace was that we had a we had a client who just kind of believed in the company and everything we stand for and also the team that I have behind me. So I think that's what really assisted us. Having a product that works and that's proven to work, I think that was the huge moment for me because the thing is I do have quite an academic background behind me. So having something that's tangible that I could see that's actually producing results that I can actually take back to my client was definitely the aha moment. Um, yeah. 
Amazing. Um, so I only have one more question for you. I think everyone is, is uh, shy to raise their hand, but please do if you have a question. But uh, the question that comes to mind is you say those incubators were really helpful and helped you to get your business off the ground. Um, are you able to share the names of those incubators that you, that you used um, and the areas that they were based in? Sure. Um, so the Squidnet, um, I use this, personally, I use the Squidnet in incubator last year. Yeah, I think so. And that is an IoT based one. So we just merged the kind of two knowledge with AI and everything. And they were based in Pretoria. But I do know of um, CEDA. Um, I know a lot of um, another thing that also was really helpful along my journey is attending hackathons because they also are linked to incubation spaces and they, that, that type of information is always readily available. So I'd also just highlight that people also get, especially if you're starting out, um, you know, get into those type of spaces and all the in information will be readily available for you. Amazing. And, and you know if uh, CEDA assists with funding? Um, to get your business off the ground? Last time I checked, yes, I do. I do think that they do assist with um, funding. Personally, I'm yet to apply, so hopefully I will be applying in the near future to help us and assist us. I was invited today to speak about key learnings from a SaaS startup. I'm from RPA Nuggets, um, which is basically an AR automation um, and intelligent document processing software as a service startup. So I'm going to share a few learnings that we've learned along our journey, which is um, around two years to three years now. And um, I'm, I'm just hoping that this will be um, fruitful to someone who wants to start a startup or someone who's already in the journey and is building their own software as a service. And um, these are the, some of the things that we have learned that you can piggyback from us. So first of all, what is a SaaS or a software as a startup, software as a service rather? It's essentially a business or service in which customer services, including information tools and applications, are hosted and delivered via the internet on proprietary, proprietary software or um, by, by a digital supplier. So it's basically um, um, a service provided by a company and um, that could either be on a particular platform or usually as um, a software. So simple things in our case, like um, business process automation, um, we go into businesses and we automate their business processes. So for us, that means um, that we are providing a software as a service. So the lesson number one that we have learned when we built our P and I guess was that speed equals success. So the faster you move, um, the more you encounter your failures and the more you can learn. And the faster that you learn, the better you become in, in what you do. And therefore you can progress um, much faster and better within the business. So as I was saying, speed equals success. So we have served other industry leaders. And one thing that we all agree on is that um, something that, that people or other industry leaders that have their SaaS startups or their SaaS businesses say they would have done differently, that they would have moved fast. Yeah, what I've been asked to do is really share our story in the hope that you can benefit from it. Um, and so um, what I'm hoping to do is really tell you the, the journey we've, we've come along. Uh, we've been in the game uh, just over 10 years now um, and uh, actually I've been working in the field of in, in a way automation of decision making for 20 years before then so it's it's been a long journey and um, and so I'll, I'll give you context of that but also hopefully give you some insights around what it takes to build your own technology so we're a actually a software company we decided to not leverage third party or international automation on AI technologies, um, but rather build our own and, uh, and then sell our technologies uh, globally. Um, and um, what I learned from this journey is that it, it, it's no mean feat to take on um, the big guys, um, the, the Microsofts, um, the 
IBMs of the world have massive budgets and um, and they've got the ability to access customer bases um, that that you can only dream of. And so the first, I suppose, um, insight that I had is that I was uh, I'm glad I was so naive in a way of almost believing that we could do this because. Um, if you really do um, the maths and you do the sums and you look at the competition and you look at the resources um, that other people have, um, what happens is that you typically will steer away from trying to um, compete. And, um, and sometimes that, that's the, the challenge is that if you as an entrepreneur ever are in a position where you, you almost don't believe that you can jump off a cliff and you'll work out hard to uh, sow your wings while you're falling, um, and um, and that you'll survive and thrive, you generally won't be able to crack it in this industry. It's so fast. It's so there's so much money going into it, and it's um, it's a global player. So um, you can't rely on on local advantage. In fact, sometimes local advantage is your disadvantage. Um, so yeah, we started the the business just over ten years ago, um, and the problem that we were trying to solve well, was not we weren't just wanting to build AI or or decisioning uh, automation just for the sake of it. Um, we had come from a journey where we saw the the real business need, and and what that was is that when we were working with banks and insurers and telcos, we noticed that. Um, so much effort was being uh, put into coding human brains um, in decision making. Um, we use uh, training and knowledge bases to code human brains. So what we do is we will document a product manual, we'll document policies and procedures, and then we'll, for example, get a contact center agent to learn that. We'll upload the, that content into their brain and we'll, we'll test that that logic went into their brain. And then we ask them to replicate. So when you call in, they are asking questions they've been taught, they're answering the way they've been taught, and they're following processes exactly how they were taught. The challenge is that we feed them very generic logic, and then we wonder why they can't handle all the context and all the, the variation that happens to them. Um, and that's why humans have really struggled to, hand, to handle this exponential um, increase in complexity uh, because data is moving so quickly, rules are dynamically changing, that our human brains aren't coping. Um, and, and so what we realized is that actually a lot of what people do in business is that we're, we're basically replication engines with flesh on us. We replicate our business rules, uh, as we were told, and then we get companies to have uh, a lot of um, uh, controls behind us to make sure that we did it correctly. Whether we're in sales or customer service or support, that's pretty much what humans are being used for is replication engines. What we started to realize, that's quite dehumanizing. Um, and that when you go to work, you actually aren't bringing you to, to work. What you're bringing is a brain that can replicate for the company. Um, and we started to ask the question, how do we rehumanize the workforce? How do we make work something which uh, makes makes you more you, liberates you and allows you to become a better person and a human. Um, and, and for us to do that, what we wanted to do is to stop humans being replication engines. And we started to study how do you, how do you extract logic from a human brain? Because it's not sitting in data systems where you can get uh, AI engines to go and source that data and then predict off it. The logic doesn't sit there, it sits in a brain. And only a few people know the rules and only a few people know the pathways. And they, they struggle to tell you that because it's subconscious, it's sitting in their brain, they can't tell you that. Um, it's really what experts, there are few experts, um, and what we're trying to do is extract that. So that's what Clever, the technology we built, uh, is all about, is how do we build digital experts that, that can replicate and operate like a human expert um, ask questions like a human expert does, uh, give answers like human experts do, trigger actions like they do. So that if, for example, you're calling into a contact center in a telco, um, you currently are talking to a human, we were asking the question, couldn't you talk to a, a digital expert and have exactly the same experience because the replication is being done uh, by the human brain, let's do it through a digital brain. And when we look globally, we couldn't find a lot uh, technologies that did that. Um, we found technologies that really could have, are brilliant at, um, at machine learning and, 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 and all of the prediction stuff, 
But when you're in a bank, you, you don't want self-learning engines. You want something that can get it right every time, that won't, won't uh, go rogue on you. And that's really what we just, why we decided to uh, build our own technology, something that could help banks and insurers and telcos in a way build a digital expert that uh, can handle financial conversations, um, insurance conversations, telco conversations, as if they were uh, dealing with a, a human. Um, and, and so that was the big audacious goal. Um, and we didn't look for funding. We, as a team, um, started uh, building this and we invested two years of our lives building this, the first version of this technology. Um, literally uh, living on savings and, um, and believing that we're going to create something um, of value. And then we started to get it into the market. And what we quickly learned is that what you think you got right in a in a black box environment um, is not necessarily right when you hit the the top and you actually need to start making it work. Um, our first mistake was that we we actually designed our what we called first a business brain for a big bank. We designed it using um, what other people were using, which was decision tree thinking and, and knowledge based thinking. And we just did it a lot better, but it was still uh, what uh, based on that simplistic logic. And, and it worked like, like crazy, but what we couldn't do is maintain it at scale and, uh, and, and get it hooked into operating systems, et cetera, uh, where data kept moving. And so we almost had to go back to those drawing board and rethink our, our data models. And um, we came back with a, um, an application really for sales, which we call the sales advisor, which, which could handle almost very complex product lines as if you're an expert sales salesperson um, doing need analysis etc and, and marrying to to operational or, or products and again what we started to find when we got into the market was we had got a lot right but actually many um, companies have big crms they've got legacy systems they didn't want an aspect of what we did they just wanted the decisioning component and so we were hoping to, to bring a, a, a one size fits all a, a brilliant solution just plug in and what we started to learn is that it's not that simple many companies have different systems they've got um, uh, legacy stuff and so you you can't assume that you're going to bring one uh, solution and then suddenly it's going to uh, other uh, solutions will easily roll over and let you in they, they won't they will fight hard um, and especially if you're small you're going to struggle um, anyway, over the journeys we've pivoted, so we then moved into contact centers and did uh, contact center augmentation, uh, working with contact centers of over th you know, 1,450 agents, many of them, um, and we really you know, thrived there. But what we started to also realize is that um, many of the, the uh, people we were augmenting actually uh, were, were still just becoming voiceover artists. They weren't really being liberated. We all, almost needed to take that whole work away from them. Um, which is where we've ended up, is a platform that now can build digital experts that can give customers one-touch self-service, um, that you don't need to actually ever get to a human. You can deal with one of our digital experts and our digital experts can work with uh, back office systems and really solve very complex queries, issues, complaints, um, et cetera, without you uh, needing to go to a human. And that's been our journey. And, and so now we, we're going international. We've partnered with very big uh, RPA technology companies. Um, and we are uh, very excited about uh, taking forward. But some of the lessons I just want to end off with um, is that, um, it, again, our naivety helped us that we, we thought we could take on the Facebooks. But if you think you're going to start a company and you're going to be rich in a year, um, I think you must rethink this. This is a very long, hard journey, and you're going to be 10 to 15 years in it before you really start cracking it. Um, it takes time, it takes dedication, it takes resilience. You need to be ready for this. Um, but if you believe in what you're doing and you prepare to go that road, you will win. Um, the second is that um, don't get fall in love with the technology fall in love with the impact you make. So focus on your business value, the value you're gonna to give to your customers, focus on that. And, and don't be precious about technology. Technology is an enabler. Um, and so we, when, you, when you spend your efforts focusing on making your customers win, and that you really do whatever it takes to help them win, you generally will win with that. Uh, but if you're focusing on your technology and, and trying to convince them that your technology is going to make them win only, um, you may you may actually be 
uh, going down the wrong road. And then finally, um, our technology can build a digital expert in medicine, can build a digital expert in insurance, talk anything. It, it literally can do whatever you want. And, and it's a low code platform. So it's incredible. What we learned is that just because your technology can do it doesn't mean you should offer it. Um, pick your line, focus on the markets where your technology um, is differentiating, where there's a global player and, and shut down the options, don't open them up and become the best at something in a niche rather than trying to open up and become the best at everything. Um, that's just been some of the experiences and learning I've had. I hope that's helpful to you. Um, I really wish you all well. Um, this is an incredibly exciting space that we're all playing in. And, um, and I, again, I believe that you almost need to feel happy at times to jump off that cliff and believe in yourself. Because if you overanalyze this, you won't do it. Um, and we need more people in Africa jumping off that cliff because uh, there is brilliance in this continent and we just need to unlock it. So it's the, uh, you're up against the behemoths and you have to be able to handle huge complexity. Um, we were just fascinated at the problem we were solving. So we were so in love with solving this problem that actually we did whatever it took to make it work. If I was purely about money, um, uh, you know, I would then try and raise off somebody else's budget so I didn't have to get as gray as I have got so quickly. Um, but I also would, would look at, at the models in which, um, you know, the software, the service models where I can deliver value to, to companies, but I'm not selling the functionality, I'm selling the impact. Um, and those really would be awesome is if I could, if I could uh, you know, sell people an outcome rather than having to convince them about the, uh, the features of my software and their buying licenses. Um, use of it would be better um, in terms of that. And in fact, from funders' perspective, they are far more interested in technologies that um, don't go enterprise, that actually go, that, that have a, uh, an offering that you use the technology to deliver a value and a service and it's not actually the technology it's the, the value that you're offering you're just enabling it through technology that's those are the ones if you get those right you're really onto something i we went the technology road and so now we are are really having to convince people that our technology as a technology and platform because it's an authoring platform like a wordpress is a, a authoring platform for websites ours is an authoring platform for digital experts you can build a digital expert from nothing using a low code person and so it's really um, an enabler and so they want to know everything about your technology and why is it uh, better than x y and z and um, etc so you, you it's a different uh, plan so just again if you're going to build technology and try and sell that technology as a working platform i believe it's a it's a, a very hard road um, but if you like like us are just passionate probably a bit nuts and crazy and, and you and you're going to do whatever it takes then there then the rewards are there for you but, but be prepared for that journey um, if I ever you are looking at an impact, you're wanting a service to a customer or to a, and you, you can deliver it through technology. Uber, for example, I mean, I'm not buying Uber the software. I'm just leveraging the service that they can connect me to somebody and I can drive from X to the Y. So those are the ones, if you can get right, um, there's massive value. In, but you've got to think through that and you've got to um, design smart. And then I think so often you need some funding for that because they're long, long tails and you're earning incremental amounts, but they work out very, very uh, big incremental amounts in terms of the curve if you get that right. But those tend to be the ones you need funding for. We, you know, we looked at, we, we sell funding. So we almost need people to pay us quite a lot up front to keep us going. Um, and we can't survive on the little bits. Yeah, that's a great message. So definitely in looking at getting started, you know, look at that business model, look at who you're, who your clients slash customers will be um, because it's a very different journey going sort of direct to consumer kind of thing versus business to business. Yeah. yeah. Um, great oh, sorry, just on that, uh, Christy, I mean, uh, just know if you're going business to business, you're up against internal competitors who themselves have egos and they believe they can do way more than you and they could do anything if they could just use, uh, you know, X, Y stack and they, they, they could code anything. Anything can be coded, anything can be done. And so you're up against uh, real competition. Um, even though yours is brilliant, um, it doesn't mean that it's going to sell. There's so many other aspects to it. There's so many compliance issues. There's so many uh, procurement hurdles that you're up against. There's so many support uh, deployments, um, etc. So 
um, yeah, you've got to be ready for it's, it, your software is just the beginning. The, it's it's the complete package you have to be able to support globally, and and, and that you you often underestimate. You know, if you're a coder, you think you just build a product, they will come. The product's a fraction: marketing it, selling it, implementing it, supporting it, handling all of the financial complexity of it. That's actually the business, and that's uh, often I think where people are totally underestimate what it takes to get these type of technologies over the over the chasm and, and that's why so few win so if you it's, it's the fractions that actually get over that chasm yeah absolutely and i think um as you say a, a lot of the times the investment goes into building that technology but they don't know how to take it to the market and it kind of dies there so absolutely. Um, I'm seeing some uh, nice messages coming through. Wendy says it's a very powerful message that you shared. Um, and Paul says, Ryan, thank you. You've got to be out of your mind. <laughs> He's right. He's right. Yeah. Um, and another one, uh, awesome, uh, that it's a South African company, Keva. Um, and I think that's quite a good point uh, in terms of you started in South Africa um, and you're only now looking at going globally. What was your decision to go globally and where are you looking at going first? So I think what happened to us, um, COVID actually was a blessing ironically, um, and it hasn't been a blessing for many, many people. Um, we had to, we actually had to uh, reimagine, and but what it helped us with is that we suddenly became location non-specific. Historically, I was trying to sell, for example, to banks in, in, in London who demanded that I get on a plane and, and go for a sales meeting face to face. There was no such thing as you can just jump on a Teams meeting with us. Um, and we had to have a business office there because if we didn't have an office, they didn't feel that we had we, we could give them the support. So the cost impl impl uh, implications of offering our technology to international customers was huge. What suddenly changed is that I, I could now be entirely uh, remote. I could sell to you remote, whether you're in the States, England, wherever, um, and I could support you through the cloud. So having to have a, a location-based support mechanism and sales uh, became less relevant. And that suddenly uh, allowed us to reimagine that our customer base could actually be global. It didn't need to, you know, whether it was in Joburg or whether it was in London, it actually almost is now irrelevant. Um, we can we can deliver the same value at a different cost structure to to people who are location bound. So interestingly, being in South Africa and being in Africa, our cost structures can become our competitive advantage. Our timelines can become competitive advantage. So um, we can now start businesses that look at global markets first rather than local markets. I, I was fascinated by the Israeli model. I mean, I, uh, I've uh, chatted to quite a few and they don't start a business that that starts uh, growing off the local economy they start immediately uh, thinking about this business must serve international markets and they that is their starting point whereas what happened with us is you start south africa you start with the person down the road and then the joburg person etc and Actually, they become a problem to you because you build your business model around location specific, but also you get your first customer and they say, oh, I love what you did here, but won't you just add to it, add to it. And very quickly, because they're your first customer and they're giving you money, they start spreading you and they actually start making you a generalist rather than a specialist. Whereas if you go international, they only want specialists. They only want a very the best of a specialization. So my experience is that uh, you should actually start now uh, thinking with a global hat on immediately. As servicing a global market immediately and in order to do that you have to be the best at something very specific you can't be a generalist and i think that's going to liberate uh, south african entrepreneurs and african entrepreneurs because our local economy has strangled us and has prevented us from growing and thriving um, and and now we can actually change that and i believe we can become a base we have the best place to live and we have uh, wonderful people and wonderful capabilities um, but now we can actually deliver our value to people anywhere in the world. And I think that's a huge, huge opportunity for all of us. Mm, completely agree. Uh, we've seen similar things in, in our business as well. Um, and I think there was something that I wanted to ask you that popped to mind, but it's just disappeared. But um, if I think about it, I'll ask you at the end. So thank you so much, Ryan. That was yeah. a very great message um, and a very exciting message for anyone um, starting to think out globally, not just South African as well, so that you can benefit so many people. Uh, yes, I actually just remembered my question. I think it was about scope. Um, so when you find that your client starts to push 
um, you out of scope of something, um, where do you kind of toe the line and say, you know, this is not what we do or do you do it? You know, what's that lesson that you've learned there? Again, context matters, you know, so um, you do it when you have no money. <laughs> so, um, but but also you, you do it if you don't understand what your product is and what where your boundaries are. So if you're still learning from the market, if, if you're in a way you're feeling it out, um, your customers can lead you down the wrong path. Um, if you've worked it out and you've created the, the, under, the, the distinction of what it is you want to specialize in and you become disciplined in saying no, it's the hardest thing when you're up against cash flow. But if you get disciplined in saying no, because you know that, that that's going to take you to, uh, or spread you out of your core, and rather you invest everything in your core, um, you know, that, that that's the challenge. Because again, if you've got money, so if someone can give you money that you don't have to worry about your customers for a bit and you can build on your core and get the best at your core, that's, that's great, but then you lose equity. If I ever you say, no, we're going to go for it. We're just going to hang in there. But then you have to earn the cap capital. What happens is you risk getting taken out, you know, spread, spread too wide. And then you start investing in the wrong places with your limited resources. And that's why it's just such a difficult thing to win because um, you either got the money and then you've got the, 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 the aggressive shareholders who are telling you you've got to get r ridiculous returns very quickly or you're taking it slow, but um, you've got very little oxygen and so you are just kind of surviving. Um, and that's again why I say, uh, don't do this if you think this is going to make you money. If you win, you're going to make, make a lot of money. But don't do it for that. Do it because you're passionate about making a difference in whatever you got. And that the money, as a result of your passion, as a result of your your resilience, you're just Dog, doggedness of not ever giving up and believing that you can win globally, then you will win. But um, don't start with the money in mind because um, I think it'll take you it'll take you down the wrong road. I think um, one of the biggest challenge that we have in Africa is that um, you know the whole research, development, teaching, learning ecosystem is only emerging now when it comes to the smart technologies like artificial intelligence. But it's a long-term commitment, you know, to ensure that there's a cadre or a class of people who can understand our unique needs in our environments in Africa um, and, you know, be supported to learn how to deploy these, you know, tools that are, you know, available to us to address some of these problems. You know, so it's, I, I think, you know, we need to make a long-term commitment, you know, no shortcuts, um, no um, use of buzz and, you know, just sort of pushing and saying, oh, no, this is AI, 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 and not doing the hard work. Uh, so we need to give ourselves five years, 10 years, you know, and understand the principles, the empirical principles, put a lot of rigor behind all the things that we do, the teaching, learning, and research aspects. Um, and also obsess about the translation because now this knowledge needs to translate and it needs to solve these uh, problems for businesses. Uh, because uh, at this point, it's very expensive to hire AI talent. And it's because there are very few people who understand the realistic you know, uh, needs of businesses and how, this businesses can, uh, how businesses can get value from talents in our ecosystem. So yeah, so that is my attempt at answering your questions. I don't know if I did a good job. There's not enough talent. Um, actually, I think it's not just South Africa. I think it's globally. Um, you've got your big companies like your Googles and your Amazons and everything that take up all the talent. Um, and then sort of the, the smaller companies, the entrepreneurs in the tech space that would like to get going and are looking for really talented individuals. It's kind of too expensive for them. Um, or, or very difficult to find. So, so talent and learning and specializing in technology uh, opens up your opportunities as an individual as well.